Good afternoon, everybody. Just let us know if you can see and hear us. Okay, I'm just going to check we've gone live in the group because I know it's uh, been a bit slow recently. I uh, hope everybody's doing well. I'm joined by Johnny, who's in sunny South Africa today. Not so sunny today. It's actually uh, so for the first for the first time in eight days. It's a little bit overcast, but uh, well, I kind of tell a lie when I say it's not so sunny. It's still pretty. Like I can sort of tilt across. Still pretty sunny. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit um, a bit warmer as well, isn't it? Where you are? Yeah, it's uh, today is the first one where it's a little bit milder, but it's still like um, I think like twenty five to thirty degrees. It's 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 pretty nice. Um, five degrees. I think it was uh, it was three degrees this morning where I was, so it's pretty pretty chilly this morning. <laughs> yeah, my warehouse team said it's. Um, Apparently minus six in in England. Is that it was it sure. was on Saturday. Saturday was minus six. Yeah, it was all right this morning. Saturday into Sunday was really cold. Yeah, Jesus. it was. Yeah, that's that's it's mad. It's it's, it's, it's <laughs> you worth forget, to. Don't you? you forget. Yeah, you definitely do forget. Um, yeah, I mean, you just, it's, it's it's funny how you quickly just forget like climates, and as soon as you move to a new one, you kind of forget what the previous life was. It was sort of I went Grand Canary where it was really warm, then to back to England where it was sort of frosty, minus degrees, and then now I'm back to Cape uh, Cape Town in South Africa where again it's it's beautiful weather. Um, I guess Grand Canary is pretty much an African island, so I've kind of gone back that way, but obviously a little yeah. bit further south. On, on on the globe but yeah how, how are you doing matt are you uh apart I'm from good. the cold i'm good yeah <laughs> been uh, smashing the ra this week it's been quite a few quite a few good deals out and about at the minute um seems a lot of people have brought the sales forward so if anyone's in the ra game um, and i put a post the day a lot of people have said that they've had some good success so um some really good deals out and about at the moment so been hitting the miles recently but uh yeah in the so, miles so good so good yeah, so we should we get the comments? I can yeah, see there's a... people have joined us. Yeah, so Natalie's joined us. I said hello. Lindsay's joined us. Jay's joined us. James has joined us. Uh, we've got Mark who's joined us on YouTube. Uh, a few other people have joined us. So, um, yeah, someone's commented. Um, I can't see who it is. Oh, Sean said, yeah, Sean said there's some some good RA deals. Yeah, there definitely is at the moment. Um, I mean, January is always a good time for RA deals, but it just seems to be this year, particularly. Um, seems to be a lot of stuff and what I've noticed as well um, there's lots of pockets of stock so you know like specific stores have like 30 or 40 even maybe 100 of an item rather than you know driving around and picking up like two or three from each store so it's actually it's actually easier at the moment you know I think it's still still got logistics issues I think a lot of companies are still shortage shortages of drivers so they're sending the stock in big quantities to certain stores which makes them even more likely to sell it to you because they know that they're never going to sell it in the store. And that's a conversation I've had with a lot of people this week. Is like normally they're like, "Oh yeah, we can't, um, you know, can't sell to resellers." But at the moment they're like, "Oh yeah, we've got four hundred of these. We're never going to sell them. So take as many as you want." So it's definitely um, been really good these past couple of weeks. Yeah, is that sort of back to the sort of logistics delay during covid where everyone got delayed all the all the shipments got massively delayed and then it all started coming in like now in the, and the last sort of six months to to, to 12 to a year so everyone's just sort of oversupplied because of the uh delay and now everything's just sort of coming at once potentially and now everyone's overstocked yeah. and now there's lots of deals so in that sort of scenario i guess it's just perfect for 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 arbitrage yeah for retail arbitrage for sure have you? Yeah, um, it, is. it really is. So, have you stuck stuck around locally? Then are you are you able to sort of source in your sort of uh, affinity, like your sort of local area? Or yeah, there's, sort of there's been out? a lot in my local. I've actually not been that far. I've just done lots of lots of trips. Um, so I've I've been out like every day, but I've kind of really only been you know sort of two hundred miles, which for me is quite local, as as like the furthest I've been this time. Um, and what's your sort of a lot of aggressive pricing so it's kind of like every day the prices are dropping so it's kind of like right don't buy this today come back tomorrow go back and buy it tomorrow and a lot of aggressive price drops so if you don't mind uh answering so what, what kind of spends do you think you've done in the last sort of week and deals i know i know you did a trip recently where you did a sort of 
sort of order or purchase order for like 50 60k wasn't it or yeah something crazy. that was that Have was you... like a supplier one but yeah we picked up but this is um yeah no not, not too much actually because the deals have actually been really good i think we're probably only on for about 25 30 grand so far this this the past couple of weeks but i reckon the, the return on investment will be 60 percent at least so that's all from retail shops you have to spend that much money at retail shops it's kind of insane. They, I'm sure they track those carts. I don't, I, I don't know how, I don't know how you go over. I don't must... know. I don't know. I've always wondered this, like if they, if they know who I am, or if they don't know who I am, because they're not good. Because I mean, I always, I always get VAT receipts. So I always put my address in. So you know, if, if they actually looked on the system, it's going to come up as this guy is spending like loads of money and all the different stuff. So you know, I'm not like I'm not hiding it in that respect. But no one's ever said yeah. anything. Obviously, the guys in the stores know me quite well. Um, so that helps. Certainly in my local area, I'm very well known in the area. But um, I don't know if anybody higher up actually actually spots all of mine. <laughs> Natalie's, I love Natalie's comment, don't you know who I am? Yeah, it's been a few times I've, I've, I've dealt with objective staff and thought, you know what, <laughs> I'm not going to pull the don't you know who I am card. Yeah, I mean, in these sort of times, I think I think anyone will sort of accept sort of 25 grand being spent in a week and if you're in a big you know one of the big boys like john lewis i'm pretty sure it's a nice little nice little sale and gets rid of their stock right um because mm. those are really like lossly because you're quite high, high value goods so i imagine they're not loss leaders anyway they're just trying to shift it aren't they so they just they probably yeah encourage that i imagine I right i think this is why i don't have trouble um i mean i know i talked about this a lot on like the training i did about buying the right type of goods is really important because if you're going around trying to buy bottles of prime or you're trying to buy ps5s or you're trying to buy stuff that people want then they're going to be difficult with you because they don't want they want to sell that to regular customers in the hope of an upsell the stuff i mm. tend to buy is end of line stuff so they want rid of it they want they don't want to keep it and they're making losses on it and they're quite happy to move it because it's it's like i say it's end of life and it's taking up shelf space for the new version of of the product or some other different range they want to stock so they're usually very happy to sell to me and I, I don't really encounter these objections very often um sometimes i do and it's you but it's usually more the people that i have the the issue with rather than the, the company and the store per se you know it's some particular person who seems to think reselling is illegal or you know um they're worried that they're not allowed to sell it or there's a pricing error or something so generally speaking it's not too much of an issue yeah, we're um, speaking of prime drinks. Uh, we went live with that sort of last week on our store. Uh, we're not doing the wakey wines. Um, <laughs> You're not going on TikTok. <laughs> we're not on TikTok. No, it's actually it's a good seller, but we haven't done any sort of front page advertising. Mm -hmm. I actually think Google actually banned advertising on it. I might need to do an appeal because they? they saw it as they saw it as a health and pharmaceutical product. So they thought Prime Drinks was a uh, health pharmaceutical, so they, they weren't letting me advertise it. But having said that, we're still getting like I've looked at today. We've already had ten separate orders uh, of of the, of the Prime Drinks, uh, and what I've done is set max of one per uh, one Prime per order, uh, and I've set the three different flavors, uh, and I've set the price to six pounds ninety five, which is pretty much breaking even with the wholesale price i got it so i didn't get it like some crazy wholesale like the wholesale ripped me off they made all the profit from that probably by importing from america um but you know i'm getting sort of steady sales and what i've done is because our uh, free delivery is at 30 pounds i'm selling it for six pounds 95 usually what they do is uh, order free and then i'll pay a delivery charge and i have a markup on the delivery right so i'm getting what I think is one of the most affordable places to get prime retail uh, on my store. What I know, I think it's like the, but I'm sort of trying to incentivize people to go over that 30 pounds to sort of, or to order more, right? So they can order other stuff. But at the moment, they're just ordering prime and paying for that delivery charge. And then I'm paying, I think I'm making about one pound 70 on that delivery charge. So, you know, it's pretty good. You know, we charge four pounds for delivery and for us to deliver prime as a standard rate, be two pounds 20. So, yeah, if you're including boxes and labor time, we're making about one pound fifty on those. So, you know, we're not going to wakey wine routes and going on Amazon and getting crazy. <laughs> yeah, getting a roll um, anytime soon then from selling prime. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, I don't want to. Like, I, to be honest, I just wanted to like have that offered on on the store. Uh, and the initial goal is like, which has kind of gone, but hasn't really worked out for us. Was like, I saw I wanted to break even on it, but I saw it as a marketing cost that the way you'll get the money back, right? Yeah. You know, like I wanted that sort of keyword, the best keyword, prime drinks, you know, KSI, whatever it is to search that and then it goes to my store and then you build traction and people come back and you know potentially people who have bought prime now who've set up accounts and stuff like that i now have their emails i now have their customer list and now i can sort of get more marketing sort of content to them so you know i've got 10 orders of prime and today and i imagine i'm you know we have enough stock for about you know a few hundred orders that's a few hundred emails we've got um you know to potentially market to more i imagine we're like trending more and i imagine it's pretty good for like like the google algorithms and stuff like that i need to look at the actual yeah. back door of the data so um it's not a massive secret that i'm trying to go away here it's not like some master plan but my goal was <laughs> with prime was to buy it for as cheap as I, as I could i could probably import it from america uh but at the moment you know you never really know when uh, they're going to start distributing in the UK for cheap and it just becomes available. So it was too, for me a bit yeah. too much of a risk to sort of go crazy uh, and buy containers worth. And, you know, it, it, it probably did would, would work, but yeah, oh well. Uh, and then, yeah, just break, just break even and then get that marketing. And it was always just a, a marketing trick. And, yeah, we'll see what happens. Um, the store's actually going pretty well now, uh, unfortunately. And, you know, it's a good sign, but um, I showed you guys the link yesterday where someone's faked our store on Facebook. So someone's now got a fake store of our store on Facebook, which is like scammy, where they send like fake uh, links out. But at least we know that, oh, that, that scammer has thought, oh, that store has got enough traction and enough reviews. They seem legitimate where I'm going to fake them. So <laughs> I guess yeah, that's a, is that a positive. Price of success. Yeah. It's the price of success, right? Imitation is the the best one whatever the, the quote is right so it's interesting but you know i probably like the, you know the actual sort of way of this prime drink is you should really youtube it and, and like tiktok it and then like leverage that and sort of get other traction that way and uh, get the tiktok crowd in saying this is how you get free marketing for your store um and all that sort of thing but who knows what's going to happen eventually i guess they'll have enough supply I don't know if that craze will ever run out. Is that just going to drop or are just going to keep launching new flavors? Uh, we'll see. Who knows? Yeah. Natalie said it's just the imitation is the highest form of flattery. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, no, but as, as a strategy, I think it's a fantastic one. It's one that we've, been, we've done uh, quite successfully. You know, when you have your own website, you have to have your own traffic. And when you have your own website, you actually appreciate Amazon a lot more because you actually understand why they charge the fees because you they have how much traffic they have. And actually, some of these platforms are very reasonably priced when you consider how much you can pay to have traffic diverted to your website, you know, through Google. So, you know, normally most people have an ads budget, which is a loss. You know, they're not getting that money back and they hope that they convert customers. With this, you are making money off gaining customer emails. So not only are you making a small profit, but you're effectively getting new customers, new traffic. As a result, Google will rank you more highly because you're seen as having, you know, converting sales because the conversion is very important in this. The last thing you want is traffic without conversion because that actually puts you down the algorithm and seen as, a, as an issue with your website. There's a fantastic way of gaining new traffic and not only not costing you money, but making you money as well. Like you say, you, you can potentially upsell other products or you've got the emails that you can remarket to in the future. Um, so yeah, it's definitely a very good tactic when you're starting out is to to try and get some of these you know really hot products, sell them at a reasonable price, you know just above break even, make a little bit you know a couple of pound profit on each unit, and then you know um, reap the rewards from the marketing. And of course, as say it's customers that will potentially come back, um, not just a marketing thing, but they might they might you know deliver good service, deliver a good experience. They might come back to you in the future anyway. Yeah, and. Um... The other benefit is those customers who have bought Prime, yeah, they're going to tell their mates and their family, and like, yeah, you can get Prime from, you know, after the store that, you know, that's, you know, word of mouth and it gets spread. It's just sort of being marketing, isn't it? So today, it's not actually a Shopify episode, isn't it? We, we were talking <laughs> no, it wasn't about... meant to be a Shopify episode or an RA episode. No, it was actually so we... a bit. 
Um, what, what we're going to discuss today was, was firing yourself. And I think you've, you're the poster child for that today because I'm in my warehouse and you're currently in South Africa. So I think you're yeah. really the poster child for it today. Yeah. It's like we've done like the non, I guess it's sort of kind of clickbaity, but I have to put that, put it out here that, you know, Andrew Tate, who, you know, no one really likes to talk about anymore because obviously what his <laughs> charges that, uh, not charges, sorry, what's being accused of him is obviously absolutely horrific. And if he is found to be guilty, then he's a very horrible person. But his main thing and his main marketing was that people wanted to get out of their nine to five, escape the mm. matrix. And his sort of marketing was like, you know, quit your nine to five and start doing affiliate marketing, Amazon FBA and like eight different methods. And he had a very basic way of like drawing people in through that. And he'd always say, escape the matrix, escape the matrix, move to Thailand, move to South Africa, move to wherever he said, move to Romania. So, you know, what I think what we're talking about here is, I guess, more of a, uh, I guess a more specific approach where, you know, we've escaped the matrix <laughs> through, um, through, through Amazon and, and e-commerce, right? And not some sort of LMM sort of marketing scheme or, or training scheme. You know, we're, even though we're offering yeah. training, we, we made our passive, we made our living. I know a lot of people say this uh, before we started the training where uh, unfortunately, a lot of charlatans, um, you know, the who, are, who we all know, <laughs> they made their living from training and not from the actual business they do. Yeah. And some of, some of them never even really start their business. They just, all their plan was like, let's know the basics and then let's sell courses on that. So it's sort of like, let's do a sort of 10, 15 minute, no, so one day is Google research on a topic and then let's do a course and it's like an MLL uh, course. And, you know, there was like NFT courses last year by Amazon sellers and stuff like that, were, which turned out to be like complete scam where unfortunately a lot of people lost a lot of money. And, uh, you know, what we're talking about today is not that. We're not going the the NFT scam, pay free £4,000 for that sort mm. of thing. We're going to say like, how do, how, do, how do you quit your job? Like, how do you, how do you actually fire yourself and what are the steps and um i think me and you should probably let's preface this with that you know for us we're you know double income we both have partners who make good in good good income as well mm -hmm. so and we both have no kids so you know we're double income no kids so our sort of responsibilities are a lot less of someone yeah. else so we um you know we we have the golden spoon you know, to say, to, to put it that way, we're not, it's like, not like a rags, like really difficult, but we've, 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 that's the sort of preface I like to put. But uh, if there's anything you want to just add to that. Uh, yeah, no, I'm going to say, I don't want to, yeah, yeah, it doesn't want to come disingenuous because you always hear these rags to riches stories. And I think for both of us, we are not rags to riches, really, are we? We, we obviously, we work hard, but it's like you say, we, we, we have fortunate circumstances which which help us so i think we should we should address that straight away but that doesn't mean that people in other circumstances can't get to that point but here you just perhaps you know maybe going to take a bit longer have to do it in a slightly different way a bit less risk for example you know i when i started my business full transparency i was 20 21 out of uni living with my parents i had no risk i had no risk at all i had like twenty thousand in savings that I'd, I'd, had been given to me um you know i'd either save myself or it was you know a bit of inheritance um and there was no risk for me because if it all went tits up well i'll just go and get a job in a few years time so that, that is a full disclaimer there but like i say it's um it doesn't mean of course that anybody can't get to this it's just going to potentially be a slightly different path it's true but yeah you say saying that it's like you're turning twenty thousand into a multi seven figure business which cash flows and uh, has made you now be able to travel. You know, you've taken mm -hmm. you know three, four months off your business, and you've said before that your business had grown bigger by the time you got back after not spending three to four months on it. So, you know, for me, like I think maybe two years ago, I'd always look to you, and like I knew I, I remember that story that you said on one of these podcasts, and I said where you said I went away for four months, I came back, and the business was bigger, uh, yeah. even without my input. So, yeah, do you. Yeah, I, I don't know if we want to start from the beginning or just sort of should we just mention our stories briefly. Like, uh, you know, for me, um, you know, I started this sort of in the e-commerce world 15 years ago. 
started the eBay thing. I ran eBay uh, and sort of private label, sort of importing from China, sort of silk ties. And I started running through that through university. That gave me a sort of bit of a buy and sell sort of knowledge, importing, private label, you know, got to the sort of top rate of seller on eBay. And that sort of gave me a sort of foundation. And I really enjoyed that. Um, then I worked in a, a job for three, four years. And then four years ago, I went sort of three, four years ago, I was sort of full time in, in property and and Amazon. But, um, you know, there's a lot of things in, in the way where like, you know, I had that property background before where that will pay me a little bit of a passive income. But to get to where I am now is two year and a half ago, started the warehouse and that added a whole new elements of having to, I guess, uh, you know, delegate different tasks I was doing to be able to, to fire myself and then move to eventually South Africa. So um, it's a little bit, it's more for me, it was, you know, source prep everything myself then i used a prep center then i used a warehouse and now i have a team <laughs> so that's essentially the the sort of route and a very basic way which we'll go through sort of in detail uh so for you what was your sort of when you first started your business were you working from your home um yeah how long so was when, it I, when i very first started i started in uni I mean, I'd always been like wheeling and dealing. I'm sure you were the same. But um, in mm. uni, um, I started and I was, um, it was while I was at uni, just looking to make some money. Um, so I, I obviously spotted the FBA thing. Uh, and what I started doing originally was buying stuff from um, secondhand stores and leveraging um, FBA to get higher prices, essentially, because Amazon's reputation. So, you know, um, that really helped. So I started particularly doing video games. Not sure there's so much of a market there now, but certainly when I started, you know, I was doing secondhand video games, sending them in massive boxes off to Amazon. I had one of them little disc machines. I used to clean all the discs, yeah, uh, make sure they're all good quality, send them off to Amazon in boxes of like a hundred, and I'd make three, four times my money. And um, while I was at uni, I was making sort of like two grand a month just doing like a few hours on the side. So, you know, it was really good little income. And obviously, then I graduated uni, and it kind of came crunch point of like where do I go now? Do I go into business or do I get a job? And I actually applied for a few jobs. Um, one was an estate agent, no less. And the guy in the interview said, what on earth are you doing here? Why, why are you applying for this job? And I was like, I just don't really know where I want to be. So we don't want to be here. And it made me realize, actually, you're right. I don't want to be in a job. I wanted to run my own business. So that's when I kind of went full time on it. Um, sort of back then, so when I was 21, um, I started from a parent's house uh, originally. And then we, within within three months, though, we'd got our own unit because it just wasn't because I wanted to take staff on because I knew that I needed to love I needed people to help me to grow because what I think went well with with me was I was out. I, you know, I went to do RA. I was I was always an RA, whether it be secondhand stores or whatever. But in order to do that, I needed somebody to manage the back end, and I couldn't do I couldn't manage the back end and process the process the stuff. Because when I started, prep centers weren't a thing. Okay, maybe there was one or two, but they weren't like they are now. So I knew I needed somebody to process all the stock, you know, clean it and prep it. So I had to kind of build the system out right from the very beginning because I was out, you know, three or four days a week, even then going out, getting stock. I mean, I only went locally then to a couple of stores, but I still was out and out regularly. So that's kind of where I started. Um, yeah. And then we kind of grew from there. We just went through different warehouses and... Um, so my business has never actually been outsourced in in you know to a prep center or anything. I've used, I use FBA, but I I leverage FBA because of obviously the high prices and the, you know the buy box. Although I think we're kind of getting more different type of conversation. We're kind of going more back towards them. Um, you know, MCF now multi-channel. So a much fulfillment has been quite competitive. But when I started, FBA was was it. You know, you weren't selling on Amazon unless you're selling FBA. So that's why we we outsourced that side to FBA, and I think that did help us grow. Yeah. So we just saw a bad track there. I think it's sort of like step one. Um, you said you moved into your first unit after three months. Is that right? Mm -hmm. After starting? Yeah. That's, that's, that, that's, yeah. that's short. That's, that's very short. I'm a bit, a bit frustrated with the mess okay. and stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I imagine that wasn't a, was that a free, that wasn't like a 3,000 square foot. Or, no, yeah. it was a uh, 500 square foot office. Okay. It was literally like, you know, one of these like serviced offices. So it was like, nice. and it was on the first floor as well. So it was like the cheapest space I could find at the time. It wasn't really suitable, to be honest. It was like 300 square foot. It was like 500 pounds a month. 
but it was a brilliant, space and it, and it did work for us so that sounds brilliant so you know the, the three months of the, the first step you know how, how do you actually get to a position where you can sort of delegate and you know step step away and do the things you want to do and you know, fire yourself from your business um is you've got to learn the business itself right you, you the, the first three months and for me i guess the first year uh was really understanding um everything that's got to do with amazon and and e-commerce because you know when you start to hire um it's impossible really to well, impossible for, for, for amazon and stuff like that you have to understand everything that you're doing in order to pass on your skills and your systems so if you're just sort of you know starting your own business but you don't know what you're doing then obviously the first step is step one is learn the business learn everything you can about amazon and sort of get obsessed and work really hard and really know your stuff so i'd say like yeah step one of everything right before you get a prep center before anything is understand the business try and do everything you can um you know try and fit it into your sort of work schedule and um you know every hour you get that's free really it, it, you know in my, in my view if you're starting a business it should be somewhat of an interest i think so uh, every yeah. sort of hour you're doing when you have free just yeah put it into the business learning as much as you can listening to podcasts you know i'm infantry and all the sort of basics and i, I think that's always the fundamental step one so if you sort of yeah think like what after the, after that was the sort of natural route is i would say is potentially like you have to think well do i prefer sourcing or do I prefer prepping? You know, if you're working from home, I say you have two directions, right? You, you either have to think to yourself, are you more of a, do you prefer the sourcing side or do you prefer the sort of prepping stuff, right? So in that way, you have two routes of like, where do you put your first money? What do you invest in? What's your first, what's your first overhead that you're going to invest in, right? And I guess that sort of takes you into two routes where for me, I, I really like sourcing and up until probably a year ago, I was sourcing pretty much nonstop for the business. And that was all my main thing. I used to love doing it. Uh, I used to do it at my previous job. I always like data and always like doing that sort of thing. Uh, but I stopped doing that. Uh, but so for me, it was to move the prep from the house um, and out of, you know, yeah, clear some space because it was and pretty yeah. crazy with the Fort with the Fortin's chocolates. And uh, I always bring up Fortin's <laughs> chocolates, but Fortune's chocolates used to come in like eight to ten boxes, big boxes of chocolates, and uh, I'd get that out the door in a few days, sort of thing, for uh, for Christmas time. So for me, the first one was get out of the house uh, and concentrate on on sourcing, and I started using a prep center. Obviously, you didn't have that luxury, right? With no, the, the prep no, center so, back yeah, in the time, I didn't didn't have a prep center because I don't think they existed back then. Because, <laughs> like I say, I've I've been on Amazon for a long time, and then. I was one of the first people that kind of started, I don't know if was the first, but, you know, I started at the start of FBA in 2011. Um, I'm not sure exactly when it started in the UK, but um, I was certainly very early in the beginning. So it was quite a new concept. And, and that was actually kind of my whole business, essentially, uh, in the very beginning, was literally just buying things and putting them on FBA because FBA, right at the very start, had so much leverage and you could get so much more money because, back then having something delivered next day was just like inconceivable you know you know 10 10 years ago you would be looking like three to five days which could be considered express delivery now then amazon just come along and go right we deliver everything next day for 79 pound a year um it was a complete game changer now it's the standard you know i think most people most companies offer that but back then it was um a very unique offering yeah precisely precisely so, yeah, that's that's the thing, right? You've got the the prep center route or, or the, the sourcing route, and I guess what we're sort of starting to let's get into this is the sort of fundamental basic Amazon business, where basic Amazon business, but sort of FBA only business. How would you fire yourself from that FBA only business? Well, the first step is how what you need to cover the there's two chunks, right? Admin admin yeah. sourcing and, and and prep center. So. The sort of prep center really covers a lot of the packing and really takes away a lot of the stress, right? But you're adding, you know, 40, 50 P plus, about 60 P per yeah, unit, unit to, yeah. to to your margins. So, you know, you need enough volume to start to absorb that. Um, unless you have some sort of injection, 
you know, you need to sort of build that volume up, get enough sales so you have enough net profit, and then to reinvest that and invest your profits or wherever you have left into, I guess, the other other side of the business, which is admin and sourcing. So from a very basic uh, business, you know, all you really have to do from there to sort of fire yourself on, almost from this sort of passive business, whereas Amazon FBA only is, I guess, hire uh, a virtual assistant or two who will cover the admin and will cover the, the sourcing but uh, yeah, yeah, you know, sourcing side. But you know, there's obviously going to be drawbacks with that. Where um, there's nothing unique about that. It's 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 very uh, you know, people can copy and paste that business quite easily. And you know, going F player F only is awesome. But if you're going to go, you know, I want to go fully passive, hire a bunch of VAs, and go prep center. There's no edge to that business, and. You know, that's where, like, I guess what me and you've built arrogantly saying has, has, has divided, I guess, given us an edge over other people yeah. where, you know, you go to the OA side and you, you outsource sourcing and everyone's buying from the same, you know, retail and online arbitrage shops. And you just sort of diversify by going to other marketplaces and really concentrating on cash flow and stuff like that. And, and all that sort of thing and that's great and that that works really well especially in like america um works really well but for us you know what the next stage i guess for us was getting that warehouse right and i think that's where it really does add that complication of finding yourself from an e-com business right is when you get that warehouse and you get that physical staff you start paying payroll you start uh having to manage people's feelings and you know, manage getting people on the ground who can actually look after other people, right? And this is yeah. where the the expenses get really, really high, and you really have to sort of it gets a, a lot more difficult. So let's let's take you back to, to when you first moved into the warehouse. Um, who was your first staff member in your warehouse? Sorry, just need to... <laughs> uh, yeah. So no, I think um, we just go back a bit, because um, one thing you said is really interesting that just occurred to me. One, we yeah. we have quite diversified businesses, but we've both kind of come at it from the same approach of we both sourced ourselves, and I think that's a really really important thing. Um, you know, like you say, when you when you try to fire yourself, you need to kind of break the process down. So again, it all comes back to process and systems, pre-purchase and post-purchase, and post-purchase is always easier to outsource than pre-purchase because. It's a very simple set process. You know, stuff comes in, it's labeled in this way, it's boxed in this way, it goes to this place. You know, and Amazon, Amazon have created the process for you, certainly by FBA. eBay, again, have a set process. And Shopify, you have to establish your own process. But if you've already done eBay and on Amazon, you're just probably going to copy their process in some form and just adapt it. So the post-purchase, I would say, is much easier to, to kind of outsource or give to somebody than the pre-purchase and one really really important point which i think you do and i do really well is relationships with suppliers you know at the end of the day in a reselling business when you're just selling other people's goods it's going to come down to a couple of reasons why you're successful it's either pricing or availability you know you either have stuff that people don't have which means you therefore can charge what you want for it and can sell it or you're able to get it at a better price and the only way to get either of those things is to have a good relationship with your suppliers. Now, I'm not against, you know, outsourcing the, the sourcing because there's, there's always a lot, you know, certain things you can do, like have people create leads and things. But I think strictly to, to become a seven figure seller, I think you're going to need somebody who is able to build the relationships. Now, whether that's you or whether that's somebody else, that kind of depends on your business, but it's the relationship that I think is really, really important to, to having success in a, in a kind of traditional reseller business. Yeah, I think for, for sourcing and, and purchasing, there's, you know, I, I think we're looking at our models. And I guess if you're looking at the sort of strictly typical OA, FBA, the relationships don't really come into it, right? It's more how good mm -hmm. are you at searching on Google, right? It's how good are your Google searches. And yeah. that's it's, it's a skill and like understanding when deals come in at different stores and stuff like that. So that is a, a side of the business. And Again, it, it does add complications of like, how do you fire yourself when you're the person who does all the relationships and, and all that sort of thing? And I guess on, on that element of 
suppliers and sourcing and for me it's i have uh my sort of operations manager slash head of virtual assistants who you know emails us me who sort of is very good at i guess imitating me and sort of speaks in my name as a sort of ghost writer on it on emails mm-hmm. and speaks to suppliers and you know, for for us as well you know purchase orders you know as I've, we've mentioned we've I created my own software where I can send out purchase orders and orders in, you know, less than a minute, right? So, you know, and sort of if if you haven't heard the sort of rumor, guys, that that software is coming uh, exclusively to what's coming next month. So it's not actually on shell air. <laughs> yeah, so it's not actually going to go to the public. It's 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 going to be an exclusive thing to the people in the sort of inner circle, sort of uh, whoever joins. Um, coming up but you know but that software um when it does come out uh it will be an alpha at that point but you know when it's the main thing and what we're, our roadmap for what we're building towards is something that i've built for my business where i can send out purchase orders in in less than a minute obviously that has sort of saved a lot of jobs and actual sort of negotiation uh you know what's actually really good for me is hiring my warehouse manager and i think i, I don't want to skip ahead too much but uh, a, wa- a good warehouse manager is also very good at sort of negotiating. Like they're, they're good at people skills. So you hire a warehouse manager, not because they, in my opinion, are um, it's particularly amazing at warehouse s- skills of forklifts and pallet trucks and organization. Yes. It's more people skills. It's people skills. So, you know, what I do is I use uh, my warehouse manager is very good at negotiating. So any supplier really that calls up or that we want to call up, he will mostly do that. And, you know, it makes us look more professional because he'll say, you know, operations manager or whatever, and he will speak to suppliers. So that's how I've got myself away from that, that side. But I think we can come back to that. Um, so should we get, let's get to the questions or should we get to the, your, the question? I, I want to know what your first hire was in the warehouse and I'll tell you what mine is after. Should we get to the questions? First? Should we do the questions first? Yeah, because it's good to jump to the questions. Right. So I haven't got, I haven't got on Facebook. Yeah, have got you got the, here, right. I have, I am on the conversation. Uh, so it's Marina says, we are looking to rent a warehouse in Germany. What are the best tips and tricks to look at? Uh, geez. <laughs> I, 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 I never looked. <laughs> it's hard work. <laughs> the German admin system is one of the worst I've ever dealt with. The sort of German admin, the amount they charge for legal fees, uh, there's a complete, complete ripoff. I, I hate the German system when it comes down to legals or anything admin or anything paperwork. They take a long time and they charge a lot of money. Starting up a business in Germany is the most expensive place in Europe. So adding another element of a lease and getting your own warehouse, um, I, I mean, I don't want to give, you know, I, I don't know your ins and outs of the business, but uh, I imagine it'd be very difficult, not difficult, but expensive to so yeah. just the admin and paperwork. I mean, and I'm, I imagine it would take a long time. So budget, yeah, it, that, dep- I'd it say. depends. Why Why are you looking at Germany specifically? Is, is, is it because all your customers are in Germany? Um, because the thing about Germany is lots of other options. So Poland is a big warehouse and the majority of FBA orders on the east side of Germany are actually fulfilled from the Czech Republic or Poland. So potentially something to look at there. Also, the majority of the companies I deal with in Europe have their warehouses in the Netherlands. They're, they're a lot easier to deal with and a lot quicker. So if it's just to get into Europe, then you know maybe consider um, either Poland or Czech Republic from a cost perspective or consider somewhere like the Netherlands, which is a bit more business friendly and a bit easier to deal with. I don't think there's going to be any like lang- there will be a bit of a language barrier, I think, with Poland, generally speaking, and certainly with the Czech Republic. The Dutch, most people, in my experience, speak English to an acceptable level. Germany is far by far the most, you know, easy to speak to. Most people in Germany speak English and to a very high standard. So that is a considerator. But I, I guess the reason why you're looking at Germany um also fba you know amazon have their own warehouses in germany and there's a few programs you can export the stuff to germany which may be it might be less hassle it's probably going to cost you more per unit but it might be less hassle than setting up specifically in germany because like you said there's loads of different compliance things and since brexit it's a lot harder now to um 
to set yourself up in Germany. Uh, like you require yeah. physical representation now in Germany. You have to have somebody in on the ground in Germany to represent your business. You can't just trade in the EU anymore, unfortunately. Yeah, to add to that, I think the only reason to get a, a warehouse in Germany and not, say, Czech Republic or, or Poland is if your business is fully OA or on arbitrage, a lot of these shops mm. in Germany were, were only delivered to Germany, so only to mainland Germany. So if you're doing one on arbitrage, then one of the, the issues of having a prep center in Czech Republic is you can only really send wholesale orders there. So if you're doing OA, you would need a you need a prep center in Germany. Uh, yeah. And you know the, we're we're paying pretty good price actually, by the way. So I, I don't know if you're looking for a prep center, and then ping me, and I, I can I can help you with that. I think it's about sixty p or something, and then hundred quid a month. So it's pretty decent, actually. Maybe bundles and 90 cents or something like that. But um, yeah, I guess the only advice we have is expensive. It takes a long time. Think about Czech Republic and Poland. Why do you need it? There's lots of options. Uh, again, unless we know the full story, it's hard to sort of advise, right? Um, but good luck. I mean, good luck. Germans are good workers. And it's just... Uh, mm. I think the minimum wage there is quite expensive as well in Germany. So there's another consideration. I believe the minimum wage in Germany is uh, something like 12 or 12 or 12.50, I think. So compared to England right now, which is £9.50, their minimum wage is also more expensive. So you're paying more for labor out there, which is the, the biggest cost of any warehouse. So um, I feel I feel like we're just putting someone off. We shouldn't be so negative. But um <laughs> No, that's it's, another it's consideration. Not negative. It's realistic, isn't it? You, you know, I, I mean, Germany's a great market. Yes, I can't turn that down. You know, um, Germany's bigger than the that's, UK that's the market I'm size. Perfect. So good, but but there is there is a lot of headache. And to be honest, if I was going to set up in Germany as a business, I would look to employ somebody who has who has either lived in Germany or is German to to work for me. That would be my approach. Rather than trying to outsource it, just get somebody on the ground who speaks German or is, you know, is is a German, is lives in Germany or has lived in Germany, and get them to 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 run it for you. Um, I think you'll have a lot less headaches and be able to deal with bureaucracy a lot easier. Um, I'd incorporate in Germany as a German business with somebody on the ground. Yeah, yeah, totally agree. Yeah, see, I think that's, I think it's Sean and Marina had a little bit of conversation saying how much you pay for prepping in the house. Um, mm. and minimum wage, but passive income covers that too. They choose hours that suit them. Most of them have kids, and I even got single mums. They <laughs> love it. Um, yeah, <laughs> so is I guess the, you the master at outsourcing to to, to single mums. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting that model. It's just like the the admin and the effort of I guess. Do UPS go to each house, or do you sort of collate the parcels? And how much does actual actual collate all the parcels from all the different single mums' houses? Like, what's the actual cost and time impact of that? So, um, be interesting to to, to know and how many parcels they have, how many FBA stuff do they do per hour. That'd be interesting to know as well. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah. Uh, so another Facebook user. I don't know if Matt, you can read about. Wow, this is would be a gem. Uh, just where we just. Oh, that's Andre. Andre's put that. Yeah. Andrew's okay. Put, um, yeah. Nice. So, so for... this year. Uh, you had a very good, uh, good Q4, I believe. Yeah, I saw that. I saw a thirty grand. You like? That's the thing. Like, the, I think I'm not sure if it's unique bundles, but um, I think it's. I don't know what it is. I don't want to give away anything, but I, I, I it is like thirty thousand day, which is is incredible, and you know that was um from what I hear, I don't want to take any sort of thing, but I know Natalie helped, helps out a lot. So, you know, next, next month, what we, what we have coming will definitely help because obviously Natalie's going to be a big yeah. part of that project. Um, and sort of her, fo her main sort of, that's, that's her thing. Uh, so what else do we have? FBA uh, TV. Said again, um, oh yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Hayden on FBA TV. I'll just get that comment. I see Tom. Oh, FBA TV's Hayden, oh, it's on isn't YouTube. it? I can't see. I can't see. Uh, I can't see anything of the YouTube on here. Yeah, so Hayden's FBA TV. I thought, I was thinking who's that. That's Hayden. So a uh, little self promotion. Hayden has a uh, YouTube channel <laughs> called FBA TV. Uh, I watch his videos. They're, they're good. I like them. They're quite quick, quite easy good. to digest. Quite quick and easy to digest. Uh, um, yeah, so for me, I need to outsource the product creation so I can fully focus on marketing. 
So, I mean, chat GBT, right? That's what I use now for product creation. Um, that's the way forward, yeah, right? All listing descriptions are done by that now. Yeah, I encourage my staff members to use chat GBT. It's, it's a lot of people are doing that. In the, I saw like a, a Reddit post where uh, programming teachers are now encouraging their students to use chat GBT just to sort of get like the the boilerplate code, you know, the, the basics. And it's sort of always the skill now is the, the way the weighing of like is it easier is it going to be quicker to ask ask a question like a specific question to chat gbt or is it just quicker to write it myself so that's always like the, yeah. the, the trade-off now and the skill of chat gbt and asking it the right question um so yeah do you want to read on with the yeah question post? from marina again she says do you have a landline into your warehouse or mobile uh one for your mobile for your warehouse manager uh, how many warehouse staff do you have do you want to go first uh, on that one now, like, how is that now? Uh, yeah, I'm guessing. How now. many? Uh, eight or nine. Now, we just hired. We just hired a apprentice who's because the stock control just was a bit over overwhelmed. So uh, <laughs> I think we have, I think eight or nine. But I think unfortunately one of the guys left yesterday because uh, you know unfortunately prepping, uh, especially when you're doing sort of seller fulfill prime. Um, you know, great guy. I really, really liked him, but he said it was just too much. So that could be down to the eight now. But um, mm. I think a warehouse, it seems like you have a high turnover and rate, uh, rate. And when we get to it, like that's another reason to have a good warehouse manager because the turnover rate is quite, maybe not for your business, Matt, but you're, you do a lot of uh, different things. But for just prep work, it's, uh, it's a high turnaround. Like Amazon have one of the highest yeah. turnaround rates because it is hard work uh, when people are putting out 200. 250 orders a day um you know batches actual fbm orders it's, it's a lot of work um yeah so yeah the comment saying i we, we have we have eight we have eight staff as well so pretty similar sized i think yeah yeah so i've lost track on the on the questions a little bit uh do you have a landline it's the warehouse or mobile one for your warehouse manager that's, that's, that's the same one i just yeah just read yeah do you, I, I have, uh, we all, we have mobiles, managers of mobiles and the online, but online's more for customer services. So I'd, I'd never ring them online because that's for customers to ring. Yeah. Landline for us is deliveries and uh, uh, angry customers. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, it, and we get uh, quite a lot of cold calls from suppliers now who call up and want to work with us, which again, don't own Shopify too much, but the benefit of having your own niche sort of Shopify store you will have suppliers and brands calling you and it kind of twists like when you when you first start the business you're the one chasing but eventually it kind of goes the other way around where brand suppliers want to be listed in your store and that's that's the beauty of it um yeah cool so, so yeah a lot of questions uh yeah yeah i, 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 from, I need to get uh, facebook yeah you do yeah and people need to get on StreamYard. So if, when it says sign in on Facebook uh, to StreamYard, can you please do that? Because it, um, it puts your names on the comments. Because when we're all on our screen, we can see uh, on the, the StreamYard is just Facebook users. So it's very difficult to see who's who. Uh, but uh, we've got another question. Oh, just lost. Uh, Jana said, I sell near you and use a very good prep center in the Czech Republic. Definitely a lot cheaper and easier. Yeah, perhaps, Marina, you want to reach out to Jana, who's, uh, who's got one in the Czech Republic. Um, yeah, we use them as well. It's really good. About the EU, yeah. Um, yeah, again, 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 the prep center thing depends on people saying in the comments about your, your margins and your pricing. You know, 60p, I think, for Johnny is probably unacceptable because you sell quite, I say, lower value goods in big volumes, don't you? Whereas I sell much higher value goods in much lower volumes and therefore the price for a prep for me would be would be no difference. Uh, whereas for you, it would probably be a lot of your margin, wouldn't it? So depending on what your model would depend, I guess, whether you need to, whether you're able to outsource um, into the EU or not. Yeah, I think, to be honest, I think 60p is cheap, actually, to be honest. Um, you know, we used to pay, we used to use Kev's uh, prep center back in the day and it was 200 quid per month and then like 50p and then the pallet costs were quite expensive. So our actual sort of per unit cost was like 60 to 70p. Uh and, you know, I think getting much cheaper than that for a prep center, then their margins are going to be very thin, especially since if they're still held, holding that price of about 45p, 50p per unit, uh, and that's been going on for about two, three years, 
the minimum wage yeah. has gone up by like 20 30 percent since then right so yeah. i met that that's very that's really cheap if you can if you're staying, still paying for 50p around per unit for bundles that's that's incredibly cheap so yeah. um this uh i would agree yeah got a very um, nice comment here um this is from andre again he's yeah he had a 32k day um i think it was mostly unique bundles but yeah so it's very nice to hear that you know that we've been able to help you to get to that goal i know we're um, We've, we've, we'll talk about this a bit more, but we've got some exciting things coming um, in the next few months, you know, some training options, some software. Um, so this, this conversation is actually very timely for us because I say me personally, I'm actually, I'm actually, because I'm going to be taking up completely removing myself from the business. It means that I've actually had to really look and I was still doing a lot more than I realized. So I think we'll talk about this in a minute, but, you know, there's lots of little things um, in my business that I, I hadn't realized I hadn't actually handed over there's little, little tasks access to certain things so um, I'm sure yeah. you're the same you know um, when you want to fire yourself it's all about systems and processes and or, never being the only one with access to something because that is a uh, that is just basically a crunch point in the business which is going to going to bring potentially bring it down you know if you're if you're indisposed and and they can't get on Amazon because you're the only one with the mobile phone number that's linked to the Amazon account. That's a bit of a bit of a bit of an issue, really, isn't it? Yeah, there's just lots of lots of cost of considerations, and I, I, you know, find yourself you're never going to be fully fired until you like lose that sort of CEO position, right? Unless you hire a CEO, just completely take care. I don't even want to fire myself. I really love what I do, so I've you know I fire myself from what I don't want to do. And for me, I hated being a warehouse manager. I, had, I, I just wasn't very good at micromanaging staff and running the business and running the back end team. I also didn't want to do any of the sort of daily checkups of my uh, sourcing team and checking deals. So and then I took out, like, I hired a manager. Well, I promoted someone to a manager for that as well. So for me now, I'm just more at the top, sort of like just checking, answering your question if there's a problem and creating systems. If I see there's a problem or an issue, I will use the belt some sort of bot or some sort of way or improved system so they can work less and I can, there's more ease on my mind. So, you know, recently I've been building a lot of like Slack bots to sort of uh, give nice little overviews of different things and stuff like that. So that's the kind of cool stuff I do. But yeah, you're completely right. And, you know, with what's coming soon, um, you know, I've been sort of full time sort of coding and developing and, and working what's coming next month. And, you know, that's been a two year plus project. Um, and, you know, I've been managing a large team of developers to get that going. And, you know, what we do have coming is it's, it's um, you know, it's, it's a long roadmap. And, and, and the first release won't be a game changer, but it's you, you will be able to see like why this will become so essential for your business and you know what we're releasing really essentially is inventory management but a a, a different view of doing it a much quicker way of, of doing it uh being able to place purchase orders very quickly be able to receive stock very quickly um you know be able to create shipments very quickly uh and basically completely minimizing the need for sort of a lot of the admin tasks a lot yeah. you know completely minimizing you know a lot of softwares and actually i'm not gonna i don't want to you know we don't want to compare with we're on our own i think on our software where we there's no real competition we've kind of it's a new concept in the way we're doing things and the way you can do things um you know there's nothing of like downloading sheets and then analyzing the data we're trying to get everything in front of you in like the most quickest and best way possible and um you know what's coming what's so great about the next month is actually it's actually not going to cost anything it's it's going to be um yeah included as a sort of thank you sort of to test because we need to test out the software next month it's going to be included in everything so that's that's the beauty of the next month is like when we do release this uh this just all this training and master all this help and everything we're going to do next month it's going to be included and you know, the price isn't going to be crazy. It's going to be very affordable and a lot, hell of a lot cheaper than anything out there and any competitors in terms of training. And you get this software, which will completely renovate your business and help grow it with the, the very long and large round, round map uh, roadmap yeah. we have. So again, um, <laughs> it's, uh, that's, that's my sort of, it's exciting. Isn't it? Like, yeah. We've got some, yeah. some amazing things coming up. I think we're going to, you know, 
as a team, I think we potentially, I would say, revolutionise the industry. That's a bit extreme, but, you know, what we're delivering and how we're delivering it, I think it's going to be really, really exciting and something that's not seen before. And also the price point, you know, the offers we've released so far, I think, have been exceptional value and we will continue to deliver exceptional value. We're not going to be charging thousands of pounds for, for training courses. You know, it's going to be hundreds, under a hundred maybe <laughs> for, for yeah. some of the content. So it's going to be very competitive with price. Yeah, so for me, like, I I, I don't like it when, um, you know, from my, my moral standpoint, I wouldn't say to someone that you've got to give up 8,000 or 5,000 pounds now, and then over the next 12 months, you're going to get, you know, 12 months of training, and people have no idea what they're going into, but they've been sold the dream of financial freedom. And a lot of people do that. A lot of charlatans, massive charlatans, do that. And for us, it's like, we don't want that. It's just like we don't want to get one to commit. They can just join for a good value where everyone gets good value and we can build and build and build and build this roadmap. And for me, it's something I, I, I'm passionate about and I've, I, I just love uh, creating systems and, and building software. But um, yeah, like I said, what I built, you know, my ver- my business's version of it, um, you know, it did save a lot. So I could fire myself essentially uh, from those sort of admin back end duties uh, of creating purchase orders and you know analyzing stock and uh, all that is all automatic through software. So how do I find my job is, was from building this great software. So um, I think that's why it ties well in because what we are going to be releasing and the eventual version will be able to cut down a lot of hours. So systems is the key one to sort of fire yourself from your job yeah. is having brilliant systems system that you can give everything. to some, yeah that you can give to someone else. And they can easily understand it and easily implement it. And, and and it's very easily trainable. You know, something very simple. So, yeah, I think that's, that's a great comment the, here the, from someone who's, you know, the thing is, it, it, it's, you know, SOPs, which standard operating procedures, um, which is basically documentation on how things should be done, obviously, and systems as well, which is kind of like an ongoing thing. Um, one of the ways I like to think about it is you think about, think about it as a journey. Okay, so... With, with a reselling business, the stock goes on a journey, okay? Yeah. And what you need to do is you need to plan out that journey as to as to what's going to happen to that piece of stock and have every eventuality dealt with or covered by somebody. So, for example, the stock comes in. Who buys the stock? Okay, it gets delivered, right? So who deals with the delivery? Um, if something doesn't get delivered, who deals with that? Okay, then it gets prepped. Who deals with that? What if there's um, an issue with the product? Who deals with that? then it goes to FBA, okay? Who deals with the product if it goes, you know, it gets stranded, some fulfillable, something like that. Then it goes sold, okay? That's nice. I need the Amazon deal with that. When it comes back, okay, who deals with returns? Who deals with reimbursements, chasing up the stock? And then when it does come back to you as a return, you know, do I do I automate disposal or do I get this return back? And what's your process for dealing with the return and who deals with that? You've then got basically a full circle of life, I suppose you could call it a product life cycle. And every element of that is then is then covered by somebody or some department within your business, and then you know you've got a night, basically a complete circle that can just grow and grow and grow. The problem is, is what a lot of people do is they put systems in for certain parts, and then they have bottlenecks. Where, okay, so what happens when there's an issue with the supplier? Well, I have to deal with that because there's no system for that. So then you're then you're being dragged back into the business because you're dealing with not necessarily trivial things, but things that you shouldn't be spending your time on. Like you shouldn't be chasing suppliers for credits or you shouldn't be dealing with lost deliveries. That should be one of your team. So it's really important. You kind of almost have a circle of life, I guess. I, I call, it, call it the circle of life. And and you follow that product journey with every eventuality covered um, that can that can go wrong with that. Exactly. So that's, you know, that is sort of in a nutshell what we're trying to cover and what we're trying to do is, you know, that whole yeah cycle of from from purchase and w- what stock do you need to rebuy as this good stock and how do I manage that stock as well? We're like, how are we going to reprice it and and all that sort of thing and it goes to okay, so that's the stock we want to buy. How do you create the order? How do you you know track that in a sort of synchronized nice way? Okay, let's track that. Send that to the supplier or you know, order it online from Boots or Tesco's or whoever you order it from. But you need obviously a log. You need to track that. You need that's that's the, that's the way to do it. And then great. Then you confirm it. Everything paid. Then how do you receive that? What's your way of receiving it? 
Is it your prep center? Are you using a Google sheet? Okay, cool. So we're going to try and cover that well. And then obviously when it gets to your prep center, the local warehouse or wherever it is, and then how do you create a shipment? Uh, what do you do with it? What's going to happen to that shipment when it gets to Amazon? And it goes around and around. Then like, how do you know if it's, yeah, like you said, if it's going to be stranded, how's the stock doing? And it's a complete circle going around and around. And, you know, that's that was my goal and with this. Uh, what we have coming is just how do we catch that? How do we make everything like that as clear as possible? Um, yeah. And yeah, that's 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 that's, that's the, the long roadmap that we have ahead. And, uh, you know, we have a lot of cool features that we will, you know, I guess we'll have, we have a few cool previews coming up soon of uh, what it's going to be like um and you know our roadmap is is, is long and it's, it's going to be cool it's going to be cool and again it's included so <laughs> uh it's gonna be good but yeah out that way without the pitch systems um if you want to quickly just quickly cover when we first go to a warehouse for me my first staff member was a um Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was a prepper. So the first thing when you first get into a warehouse, going back to this, going back 20 minutes ago was cool. So like you, you move to the warehouse, what you want to do, I I don't know if you're the same as me, is you have a few elements and that's, you know, receiving the stock. Like who's going to receive the stock? Again, back to the software. I built custom software in receiving inventory so people can receive the stock as nice as possible so they can do it on the tablet and all that. And then who's who's going to take care of us so for us we have a stock controller so i have a stock controller who does that full time he's soon getting apprentice so we're gonna have a stock controller apprentice as well who will help him with that and then your core of your team is your packers so my first staff member was a packer pick and packer who would pick and pack orders dispatch it to the customer so currently we have five or six of them and then at the top you need a warehouse manager who will take care of those sort of things as yeah. well right so you need that warehouse manager to uh it's cover with that and why it's so difficult actually and i think for us it's like when you have those overheads of a stock controller and a warehouse manager why it's harder for myself to to buy myself from the job is you need a lot of revenue you need a lot of volume to sort of dilute those costs and that's why like moving into a warehouse you know you need to make sure you have enough volume so you can actually fire yourself and move to south africa because at the end of the day you need to dilute those overheads um so I think the key message I wanted to put on this podcast was just because obviously the, the core message is how do you fire yourself is you have these overheads, rent of the warehouse, boxes, packaging. You know, we spent three and a half grand on in, in, in November on packaging. It's a big cost. You know, you have packaging, warehouse managers, rent, electricity, like 20 grand a month yeah, year we, now in we, electricity. We just spent, we've just spent 1,200 pound last month on electricity. Yeah. So your costs add and add and add. So, you know, you have these overheads as well, of course. Of I call the overheads of the warehouse manager and the stock controller who are not actually uh, processing units, but they're enabling processes of yeah. the units, just like the rent and just like the, 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 the roofs on their heads, right? So to actually get to a point where you can walk away, you need volume to dilute those costs by processing more stock and reducing those prices. So for me, how do I do it? I built up revenue, built up systems. I hired the packers, and then I got the warehouse manager, got got on really well with him, great dude, really like him. He then took over as the management, spent about two months with him, ensuring that he's got everything in track, learning the warehouse management system, learning our software, uh, learning about FBA, learning about dispatching. And there's a lot learning about receiving, uh, getting his head around e-commerce, basically. Yeah. And then once you've got that warehouse manager who is comfortable and all that, uh, you know, you build from there. And then you can sort of, for me, I, that's when I could have walked away. I still come back every sort of two, three months to check on the team, but I have absolutely zero input on the warehouse now. I don't want to, like... I do Slack bots. I have like little coding snippets which help with the their jobs. So I try and help their jobs, but I in no way I'm need to be at the warehouse. If I'm packing stuff, I'm probably in the way. If I'm speaking to the warehouse manager at the warehouse, I'm probably distracting half the time because I'm talking about football because he's a football fan. So for me, I'm more of like a yeah. That's that's for me how I kind of fire myself is by building that system and building a good team. But again, the warehouse version of that is pricey. So that's a little thing of what I wanted yeah. to 
the start of this podcast, bring up the, the cheaper way, the, the, the FBA only model, but we've gone for the expensive model, but way more di- yeah. div- diversified model because we have yes. FBA, Shopify, eBay, FBM, Seller Fulfill Prime, right? So and we've got a, unlimited potential, you know, I think with, with when you've built the team, you can go in any direction. Like I know me and you've discussed that we're going to start doing more wholesale things this year, you know, buying from our suppliers and selling to other people. So you've got unlimited potential. The problem with just FBA is you can just do FBA because it doesn't work in any other format because it's so it's so streamlined and processed. You know, you can't you can't do wholesale because Amazon charge you the same fee for every order as as a much small channel fulfillment order. So your wholesale savings are gone. You know, it, it only works for FBA, and that's that's one of the beauties. Now, if you only want an FBA business and you're quite happy, you know being a solopreneur with a couple of team members either outsourced and you want to travel then then that's a great way of building it but if you want a great way really good way more business a business yeah exactly and it's a great business as well you know and it will give you a lot of freedom but you've got to be careful doing that i think building that kind of model because you why i think some people do is they just create a job they they just they move from one job to another yes they have more probably you know locational freedom because it's a laptop and they can work wherever they want, but all they've done is created a job, you know, where they have to work, they have to do this, and then, then other people do this. So you really, I think, really to build um, a business that you f- truly fire yourself from, you need a solid team, and you need people on the ground that can can go and do things. Um, I, I do think, think it's very just difficult. A, yeah, yeah. Just to butt in, uh, like, I I do think like what some sellers have done, they 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 have hired operation uh, operation managers who will take care of that yeah. so like that job and then this passed on to the operation manager so they will build their fba outsource business to a point where their volume's enough to then hire operation manager who will take care of the sort of issues of prep centers and the issues with yeah. um staff members so i think it's, it's a lot easier way of quitting your job and i you know it's recommend yes. I, i'd say that's the it's the more uh it's the easy way that i think most people would take it's just that's, it's yeah, just the it's easy, it's definitely quicker. easier, yeah, hundred percent, and it's quicker as well, yeah, because you can scale a lot more quickly as well. But uh, I don't know if it hampers your growth long term. I think that, that, that depends on your goals. If you're just looking to replace your income with with something that gives you more time freedom, then maybe that is the better option. It depends what you want to do. I think me and you kind of are keen on building bigger, big businesses, you know. Whereas if you're just interested in creating an income, then that is a, probably a much better option to go down. I think in America, especially, I think in America. Um, using a free PL, it, it, you should 100% use a free PL in America because <laughs> because you have like insurance costs and when you scale in America after over 25 staff members. Uh, the other thing as well is that stuff like Merchant Fulfilled and Self Fulfilled Prime do not reach the entire of America, right? And FBA is so much better, has so much bigger reach. So yeah. the biggest benefit of having your warehouse for me is Merchant Fulfilled. Right, it's, it's just great margin. You can sell stock instantly. Right, seller fulfill prime for me is just amazing. And I, I think when we're talking about like getting your warehouse, and it's another topic again. It's like the UK is so much different to America. In America, I, I wouldn't, yeah. but in, in the UK, I would because seller fulfill prime is so good in the UK. Like I'm, I keep saying this to you that you need to get on seller fulfill prime, but it's <laughs> yeah, it's incredible. It's the the fee. It's cheaper than FBA for me now. Like the, the fulfillment costs, um, but yeah, sorry, we kind of backtracked. I went sort of <laughs> a, a, a tangent now, but um, uh, yeah, I think a warehouse in the UK is just uh, it's 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 builds up a much more diversified business. I think the model that a lot of people do with FBA and hiring virtual assistants, the way they can diversify is by replicating that model in a different marketplace like Germany and America, and I think that they're they're solid businesses. Um, but you know, you just got to ensure that you. There are obviously issues, right, with restock limits, just doing FBA and all those sort of things. What happens when the algorithm uh, way towards, um, you know, MF? What happens when FBA is too full? What happens when America releases minimum order quantity? Like, uh, I don't think America has minimum order quantity yet, right? Yeah. So one minimum order quantity completely change groceries in the, in the uk if you're not doing minimum order quantities and groceries in the uk you're missing a huge trick you're missing so much margin potential there that i would say an fba only grocery business is 
is not that great. But when you start doing MOQ and MF and Certified Pool Prime, it just turns into another into another level. So again, FBA, like the whole virtual assistance bill, great stuff. But again, you have a very one track way of doing it, and that's higher price goods and stuff like that, right? You've got to go higher price goods to sort of minimize and cut out that sort of prep fee and all that sort of thing. But it is definitely a much easier way to a much yeah, fire yeah. yourself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, we've got a couple of questions we'll just jump to. Um, so I think it's Marina's asked again, uh, how big is your warehouse? How many square meters? I was about to go shopping on Facebook. I can see this live, a live pop-up, amazing tips. Um, well, I've got a two and a half thousand square foot and an eighteen hundred square foot, but we're currently moving the eighteen hundred square foot. We should be signing, hopefully, uh, a new warehouse on the same estate because they're on different sides of the town. Unfortunately, we couldn't get two together, um, so we're hopefully getting rid of the one of them and moving into one on the same estate at the end of the month. So that should be good. Yeah, so I have a three thousand square foot, but uh, it's not big enough. It's you know, again, we we. we we're a little bit uh we really need to push fba more just to try and get stock out you know yeah. that's the beauty of fba is just try and get all off to fba but um as my niece says um jeffrey jeffrey bezos is currently recommending to not take that risk in business so uh, i'm a little bit on the fence about getting a bigger warehouse but we are we do have our eyes eyes peeled for a bigger warehouse and three thousand square foot ideally you'd want something like actually like a five thousand square foot um because we just want those extra pallet racks. So when we go into mm -hmm. sort of wholesale and importing more containers, we can actually sort of store it a bit better. Uh, at the moment, I think it's kind of like, it has to go in and out very, very... It's just... Uh, Move it's kind of, it's, 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 I know what you mean. There's a lot... When you have something up 3,000, there's a lot of moving around. Uh, you know, yeah. you will fit, but there's a lot of moving around. When you get that sort of 5,000 plus, generally speaking, you have a lot more moving space, don't you, I think? And it makes life a lot yeah. easier. Yeah. Yeah, so for us, it's like the, the without increasing warehouse space, there's only a few things you can do is like increase FBA, leverage FBA more, right? Uh, hire more staff members so you can then enable to send more to FBA, right? So you can process more stock yeah. to FBA. Uh, and then, of course, uh, hire more sort of stock controllers so they can again check stuff in quicker. So it sells quicker and then things go out more. And it's not just hanging out at your sort of, um, you know, inbound of the, of the warehouse. So, for us, we're trying to hire more to get more out of the FBA. Um, that's the sort of thing we're trying to do and get our eyes peeled. Uh, We've got a comment here. Um, I don't want to go too much onto Shopify. Uh, I sent the conversation for another day, but um, we had somebody in house build ours. Um, so somebody who worked for me built ours. And, and I would recommend that approach really because one thing that I think people don't, understand, don't underestimate with Shopify is it's constant tinkering. It needs changing weekly things need moving around banners need creating got to keep it fresh and the problem with getting somebody on fiverr for example there's nothing wrong with people on fiverr but you want somebody who you can go to every week who will be able to do things for you um and won't charge you a fortune so just something to consider yeah so my my advice is a little bit different um i would recommend to go for like one of those premium templates so like mm -hmm. um pixel union one of those nice little templates there uh, and I'd actually recommend not doing anything custom. I, I went the whole custom route and then realized this is going to need a lot of maintenance to sort of keep yes. it going and there's going to be bugs and errors. So I don't want to have that sort of overhead of maintaining of maintenance. So like I built like the sort of Amazon sort of style of adding to the cart and like where you could sort of you add to the cart and it say one and you could press the plus button, press two, you add the, press the plus button and you could say three. There's actually nothing in Shopify where you can do that. You have to do it custom. So I built that out and then realized this is a little bit buggy. I got to do a lot of maintenance. So I just took it all back and then went back to the default. And now I just keep it the default and just update that sort of premium template I, I uh, built. So all you really need, to be honest, is uh, good pictures and then a good banner, good web banner, with, which will display your... Uh, so what would I, I would, okay. what I do for this is buy a premium template, Get some sort of designer. Uh, actually, no. You can set up a competition, a logo competition using the current number of the website is, but you can set up these logo, logo competitions where mm -hmm. a bunch of people will give that ent uh, will, will enter, and it'll be how you have like two hundred people depending on your budget enter, and then you just pick where you think that you like the best. So get that to do that for your logo and your web banner, 
and that's all you really need and then launch it um yeah you can you can change up and make it look different with a cool web banner basically yeah that's all it's about yeah and for, like like we always say for familiarity is actually a good thing when it comes to e-commerce you know if something looks like amazon that's not a bad thing people like that familiar, familiarity uh again nothing that's a matthew Wright top tip that i'm stealing <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you do. You got to keep your website looking fresh, as customers won't come back. You know, you want you want them to you want you want them to have the right the balance of familiarity, while it being fresh and you know, things to to visit. You know, you want people to, to be able to browse your website with some variety. Yep. Um, another question: how, how much MF are you doing? Um, I'm I'm primarily FBA on Amazon, and we're also we do a lot of multi-channel fulfillment, so we have. Um, stock in FBA that we then send to um, customers who order off eBay and Shopify. Now, the reason we did that primarily was because of raw mail. So we used to be FBA was for Amazon, but it's now because raw mail back in the last year was was a disaster for us. Amazon was delivering consistently. We we moved to that model. Um, that was our primary motive for that. So going forward, we may go back to more MF, but raw mail haven't sorted themselves out officially yet. So we will see. Yeah, we're kind of running like a ratio of about 70 to 30 MF to FBA. But that's because we have Shopify, eBay, eBay. I don't even want to talk about eBay. I hate eBay. I just don't like <laughs> it. I don't like it anymore. Um, someone accused me of doing drop shipping the other day, and I couldn't remove the feedback because I use Amazon Logistics. I don't yeah. drop ship. I just use their courier service. So that annoyed me. And, and eBay yeah. wouldn't remove it. So I have a vendetta against eBay, and I'm going to leave any sort of training to Matt now because I'm. It just annoys me. <laughs> I like uh, eBay. eBay's good. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, seventy to thirty MF to uh, to FBA. We're trying. To, we want to up that FBA though. It just, it's just when you're getting like yesterday, we had seven hundred to eight hundred orders on a Monday. We got seven hundred to eight hundred orders on a Monday that we have to pack. Uh, and what happens when you have so many MF orders? Your FBA then falls behind, so it's hard to get that sort of ratio. How many? Matching people doing MF to, to FBA. And again, the only thing you can do is add staff, but then you have a constant sort of turnaround, people being sick. And it's, it's, this is the things you got to deal with, with a warehouse. So, yeah, more, F, more MF than FBA, which yeah. I don't mind. Got another question. Uh, the image software sounds amazing. Will it be useful for OA or is it more for wholesale? Thanks. Um, both. You answer that. Yeah, it's good for both. It's good for it's both. Good for both. Um, yeah, because it. it the thing is, I think one of the key things we, we, we kind of put in is it was built by sellers for sellers. So it's been built, obviously, primarily by, by Johnny and his team. But obviously, myself and Natalie have had a lot of input. And between between us, we have a, a variety of ways of selling on Amazon. Um, and we'll, so it, it, through that breadth of experience, it's been very focused on it will fit for RA, it will fit for OA, it will fit for bundling, it will fit for wholesale, yeah. essentially. We wanted to make it a system that works for sellers and not just one that's been built by software developers who don't actually sell on the platform yeah and it's not a secret like I've, I've mentioned that you know the ability to create a purchase order and there will also be the ability to send to a supplier directly and i'd say that feature of the of the software where you can directly send to a supplier that won't apply to oa but everything else the whole journey absolutely applies to oa you know, it's going to be great for everything. And, you know, it's it's not just that, you know, we do have other things like a little bit of analytics. We're not an analytics software, but we will have that. We're going to have some other cool stuff, which we can't really say right now. Um, but, it, you know, we have some very cool features that it's, it's going to 100% benefit OA, just the sending to supplier, purchase order supplier. But you should be creating purchase orders for all your orders. You need to track your orders 100%. So it's going to be perfect for that. Um, yeah, so yeah I think it, what it will do is it will take a lot of the certainly for beginners it will help because you won't have to build the systems because the system is built for you and for a lot of the other guys who kind of are you know using Google, lots of different Google Sheets and things it will bring it all in together and make it a much more streamlined process you know your staff members your VAs can go onto one system and see everything they need in front of them without having to click on seven different Google Sheets one for the prep center one for the purchases one for the tracking the stock one for the returns you know it should hopefully make it a lot, your life a lot easier and a lot more profitable because you'll spend a lot less time, you know, dealing with Google Sheets. 
yeah and you know it is still in its early stages again you know we won't have a full release for a very long time it's going to be exclusive um you know it's not going to be even a beta it's going to be before that yeah so, it's, so it's, it's going to be it ready yeah i'm afraid it's not it's it's in very early development stages so it's not so development not ready yet but it will have um people will get start getting access to it soon to to test it out but um again suggestions and all that when that comes will be fully welcome uh and it's yeah. not going to be something like when we have this offer out it's not going to be like oh now the software is in full release you've got to pay x amount no it's a it, it, you'll see the details soon but it's not going to be like we're going to add costs it's a um sort of, sort of inclusive it's a, it's a sort of thank you to sort of helping out the software but you know it's it's got a lot, a lot of stuff there but yeah um yeah. very kind comment from andre again um thanks very much <laughs> i won't bother reading it out welcome to read it um i we need to kind of wrap it up i think we're getting on for time now um i know we've got a quick question here do you run a warehouse 24 7 no i am very much we are eight till five at the moment what about yourself um we do the okay we do weekend shifts sometimes um yeah we, do, we don't do weekends or bank holidays so self fulfill prime requires a weekend so we do this we do the sunday sometimes um you should do sunday but we're desperately trying to get for some reason they're not letting us have a saturday collection of amazon shipping so we're trying to get that so we really we, we want that sort of we want to be running six days a week sunday labor costs are really expensive so we don't really want to be running on a sunday because of the labor costs but the eventual goal would be to go into sort of running it sort of 18 hours a day sort of thing yeah that would be the eventuality and you know first is get the saturday shift going uh which i want to do so we have an extra day off more processing of stock and stuff like that so uh eventually hopefully six days a week 18 hours a day or you know eight to ten hours a day it's sort of stepping stone right as you grow bigger and bigger and try and get them as much as you can out of the warehouse and you know that is, is time isn't it really um yeah 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 what's the next a lot, uh, of, questions. About a lot of questions a lot of questions i'll come through at the end yeah um, which themes do you recommend for Shopify? I, I think we will, if you want, we could put something together on Shopify. It's, it's too much to discuss now. And the theme is very much dependent on where your website is and what, what your, who your customers are. There's a, a lot of thought needs to go into designing your website. It's not just the case of chucking a theme on there. I mean, you can if you're testing it and you chuck a theme on and see how it goes, but a lot of thought needs to go into the design. The look and the feel is incredibly important. In fact, I would say it's probably one of the most important things. There is no point spending thousands of pounds on traffic for your website to be clunky and a mess and badly laid out and then customers not buy from you. So um, we could put something together on this, but yeah, it's going to be very much a, I couldn't recommend a theme because it depends on what, what, your, what your look and theme is and who your customers are. Yeah, just go for the ones with a good. I would say go for the ones with well reviewed, popular ones, which has a good track record. So, like again, like a company like Pixel Union, they have good themes that are and get one of the premium templates, which kind of costs like 125, 150. Buy that, six to that theme. Yeah, and then um, you know get someone to make a logo, uh, and then you know build everything around your sort of color scheme and, and all that sort of thing. So, um. Yeah, I'd get if you are yeah. going to get one, I'd get one off one of the third party websites because there's some on Shopify and the the free ones are a bit rubbish and the the paid for ones are, are very overpriced for what they are on the Shopify theme store. There's lots of other good uh, template providers out there. But I think you shouldn't really be paying more than I would say two hundred dollars for a theme, unless it does something particularly spectacular, would you agree? Two hundred dollars is kind of like I would say uppermost you should be paying for a theme. Yeah, I think I paid one twenty five, one fifty. Can't remember exactly how much. I think ours is one seventy or something like that. But yeah, that's your kind of your price point you want to be looking at. So, um, yeah, definitely. I mean, you can always put it together on a, on the free theme just to test out the website, but uh, and then re do a redesign later when you've got some customers and you've got some like you know kind of indication of of what it is. But yeah, the theme should be about two hundred dollars. Um, someone's asked. Kind of put myself down. We'll be releasing full details in the next couple of weeks. So yeah, we'll be um, we'll be releasing details to anyone who's interested, um, and you get the opportunity to um, to join. Um, yeah, cool. I think we just want to summarize again because I know we, we went off a few different things. I think if we just want to summarize in terms of you know how to fire yourself, I think um, the couple of key principles is going to be don't have any job in your business that nobody else can do. 
You know, it doesn't mean they have to do it, but they should be able to do it. If you have if you have a job in your business that nobody else can do, then you are still working in your business. You know, any any kind of function should every function should have um, what I call A and B people. So a primary person, a secondary person. There's no reason why you can't support your business and work in your business, but you should not be the primary person for any one job um, in your business because that is a bottleneck on you and that will stop you from firing yourself. I think as well, you know, take the leap, employ people. Your first person is going to be your hardest because you are going to have to, your, your revenue will probably go down when you take on your first staff member because you're going to have to take time away from doing your activities to train them. But it's a short-term loss for a long-term gain, which again comes down to systems. Make sure you've got your systems in place first. What a lot of people do is they take the person on and then build the systems. And that what that means is you'll have a person who will be stood around They'll be ineffective and it's not their fault. They haven't got a system to follow, which will then cost you money. You'll get frustrated. You'll probably get rid of them because you can't afford them and you'll end up back in, back in the cycle. So build the systems first. Um, and then, yeah, and like you said, I think Dern, you kind of want to, as time goes on, you want to appoint a, a kind of a number two a warehouse manager who will be able to take on your role um, in its entirety and be able to manage the business while you're not there. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and and I think the hierarchy will sort of naturally form in in, in the warehouse as well. It seems like it has for yeah, me, it will. Uh, and stuff like a stock control actually takes that sort of number two. It's usually for us, our warehouse manager and stock controller like work really closely together. And when the warehouse manager has to go off for the afternoon, he will take off, and that's the sort of natural hierarchy hierarchy that happens. But um, anyone who's got a warehouse, you know. It, it is hard work. But you get get through it. Managing people in the, in a warehouse environment is a very difficult job. I think it takes a lot of a very niche specific skill set. Uh, I'm not sure if that's really an entrepreneur. If an entrepreneur is very good at that, uh, maybe they are. Maybe that that is their skill set. But um, it's a long journey. It's it's a lot of hard work. But you know, you know, it took me just over just like less than a year to get to that point from start the warehouse to being able to move to Thailand last summer. So, you know, put that work in. <laughs> uh, work your ass off for, you know, just around a year and then uh, fly using Avios points to, to, to Thailand or Cape Town or... The Maldives, I, yeah. or, the, or the Maldives. No, I wasn't working from Maldives, but um, maybe you can maybe you can go there for three or four nights. Yeah. yeah. But again, okay, another discussion... good in the Maldives, to be fair. <laughs> It's pretty good. It's pretty good. The only problem, oh, I don't want to go into too much of a discussion, but the only problem with the, the Maldives now is the Radisson Blue hotel scheme has completely changed now. So yeah. you can't get those really good deals anymore, but that's a discussion for another time because we're always going to go too long. Uh, yeah. Cool. I think, I, I mean, I hope there's enough information now. I know we sort of went, we always do that sort of thing where we go on our little tangents yeah. and discuss, discuss other things and sort of there's always going to stuff where we're going to go into sort of Shopify and there's a lot of different yeah. elements and to actually fire yourself from your business is like, you you could break that it's down. It's a process all day and it's you... not going to happen overnight and you have to accept that. Um, you can accelerate the process, but again, you're going to need good people around you to, to accelerate that process. If you haven't got good people, you haven't got the right people, it's just not going to work. You know, and I think, I think another thing is, a lot of people worry about paying salaries and getting cheap people, if that makes sense. You know, sometimes you have to just stump up money and pay good money for good people. Um, and, and that would be the way that your business will grow. Yeah, I think, again, I made a mistake. I think I had too many young, uh, my team was way too immature. I, I went with younger packers uh, where I should have really gone with more adults. And then you add the younger people to the mature team rather than the other way around. I think that's always yeah. the move. And that's where the warehouse manager came in, sort of just completely changed the team. And again, he's a professional and expert at this. So, you know, I you know, hands off to him for like getting that team. I'm no in no way a an expert when it comes to micromanaging warehouse stuff. But that's my, that's like, you got to know your skills, right? That's another thing about firing yourself. Yeah, you got to know what you're good at. You got to know you're not where you excel. You need to know where you should delegate first, and that's usually what you're rubbish at. <laughs> so, <laughs> being a warehouse manager for me is, uh, yeah. Although it's fun drawing a forklift, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Cool. Great. I think we'll leave that there. I uh, hope you all enjoyed today's chat. Um, I think 
I'm not sure who's on next week, if it's me or Natalie or you and Natalie, but Natalie will be back next week. Um, and we'll see you around in the group as well. Yeah, she has some good guests coming up from from my knowledge and got that to look forward to. Uh, always like it seeing some guests coming on. Like I always tune in to the ones before Christmas. That was always pretty exciting. Uh, so hopefully, yeah, some some fresh faces on Hill and here coming up. Yeah. Great. We'll see you soon. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Bye. Cheers. Bye-bye.